Um, so we are going to continue on today uh, with our series. This is, I believe, the fifth week. I don't know that we've ever gone this long on a subject, but felt the necessity to do so uh, with this subject. And our scripture that we looked at, that's been our theme scripture, is in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 where the prophet Hosea says, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Yes. And I had the thought this morning, um, actually here at church, I had the thought, I, I, I don't know, I think it was the Holy Spirit, but I had the thought, when Hosea said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were not equipped. You see, we can have all of the power that Jesus gave us because he said, I give you power to tread on serpents, on scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. So it's possible to have all of the power and yet still be destroyed for lack of knowledge. So let me, let me break it down this way. The United States is a very powerful nation. But what if you woke up this morning and on the news and on the TV and the emergency broadcast services were just going off, saying we are being attacked, if you can't arm yourself, uh, get ready for war, everybody, the martial laws in a place, and, and, and the government was rallying, and, and they were having meetings, and they were trying to decide how to wage a counterattack. Wouldn't the first question that we would ask is, who's attacking us? And probably the second question that we would ask is, where are they attacking us, right? Because unless you have an answer to do those two questions, what we would do is we just fire missiles off everywhere and, 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 and at anybody and everybody and maybe miss in the process the real enemy. Now, I say that to say that Christians, we have been empowered. We are powerful. Churches are powerful. We are empowered with the very power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. But yet we fail and we lose over and over and over again because we've not properly identified the real enemy. Paul made it very clear when he said you don't fight against flesh and blood. But yet that's where we do 95, 98% of our battles against flesh and blood. He said you don't fight against flesh and blood, but you fight against principalities and powers in spiritual realms. But because we don't identify the spiritual realms, I mean, that's pretty vague, isn't it? I, I mean, I'd be the first to say, what the heck is spiritual realms? I mean, I can't see it. I can't feel it. I, I don't know what I'm shooting at. So if I can't identify what the spiritual realms are, my natural tendency is to go back and bring the battle to a place that I can see, that I can touch, and that I, I can identify. Are you with me? Yes. So we do that naturally because we do not identify what it is in the spiritual realm. Now, last week we shared that there are seven named spirits or seven named demons throughout the Bible. And I gave them to you. I'm going to give them to you again. We looked at the spirit of infirmity. We, we actually talked about that last week. We looked at the spirit of uncleanness. We also talked about that last week. There is a third. There is the spirit of blindness. A fourth. There is a spirit of a familiar spirit. We're going to look at that today. Uh, there is a fifth, a lying spirit. We're going to look at that also today. But there is a seducing spirit, and there is a deaf spirit. Now, if we can identify what the enemy is in heavenly and high places, in a realm that you do not see, then we have to begin to look at what they are doing and their involvement and their influence within our life on a daily basis. 
And if we can begin through the spirit of discernment, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit given to everybody, everybody in this room, if you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, you have been empowered with the spirit of discernment. Because God wants you to see spiritually what you cannot see physically. Amen. Because as long as you and I can see spiritually what we cannot see physically, we know where the enemy is. He, remember, he's like a snake. He's likened to a snake. We, we've covered that for weeks now. He camouflages himself well. He, he can be growing right there next to you, and you never see him because he's camouflaged well. He's in his environment. This is where he thrives, and he's camouflaged well. But through the spirit of discernment, even in his camouflage state, we can see him, identify him, and do warfare with him, and cast him out, and step on him, as Jesus said. Amen. So today I want to look at, uh, I, I, we didn't have time to cover all seven. So I, I, I really want to go after the demons, the spirits that I feel are most prevalent in our society. And today I want to look at uh, the third one, which is the familiar spirit. Now, I mentioned before, I've been to other countries. And I've been to some very impoverished countries where this spirit is out in the open, running rampant doesn't try to camouflage itself. But here in America, the reason we don't see a lot of the outward spiritual activity. Now, if, if somebody came in today and they were foaming at the mouth like those two, two demoniacs that, that Jesus came across, that the Bible said they couldn't be restrained and, and they cut themselves and they cried out in among the tombs. And if we had an individual like that today, you all would go, uh-huh. I think I see a demon-possessed person. But remember, the devil, the devil camouflages himself well. So in a sophisticated society like ours, in a society that is educated like ours, in a society is that, that, is, that is too uppity to even want to associate with those that level, the devil has camouflaged himself. Same devil, same effect, same realness, he just comes through at a different way. Are you, are, are you with me? Okay, so the familiar spirit in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27 says a man or a woman who is a medium or spiritist among you must be put to death. God had no tolerance. For the demonic, God has no tolerance for this spirit, this familiar spirit. Now, why, why is it important that we look at this today? This spirit is mentioned 97 times in the Bible. That tells me that God is trying to tell us something about it. 97 times is a lot. You see this spirit being referenced to both Old Testament and New Testament. 97 times. You see, here's, here's the problem. We are created as spiritual beings. That's what makes us different than the animal world. We are created as spiritual beings. We are spiritual. We have a soul, and we are going to live eternally as a result. We are spiritual beings. We are like God. We are created in his image. God is eternal. You and I are eternal. Now where we spend that eternity depends on one very important thing, what you do with Jesus Christ. Come on. But you are eternal nonetheless. You will never ever die. You are eternal. This body will. But you will never die. You are eternal. We are spiritual beings at our core. And as such, we have a natural, built-in desire to know the supernatural. If you don't believe me, just go do a movie search someday and see how many movies are out that Hollywood produces that deal with the supernatural. 
and is built within our DNA. So people tend to do a number of things. They, they, they want to talk to the dead. People want to, some people say, I have a spirit guide. I have a spirit guide who directs me. I see shadows in my house. My spirit guide is present. I see shadows sometimes too, and I, I know what to do with it. I cast it out. Some people, they want to check their, their horoscope every day to get direction in life. And, and, and they're reaching out to their, to their horoscope. If we see on the news that an idol in Brazil cries blood, millions will pilgrimage there and pay money to be able to see this idol, this Virgin Mary crying blood. Some people go to fortune tellers. Some people are superstitious. And we do things like knock on wood and, and uh, the evil eye and stuff in different cultures because of our superstitions. And sometimes we don't even know it. But what we are doing is we're reaching, we're reaching in to the supernatural because that is our DNA to know that. Let me just be really, really plain and really clear. Anytime you reach into the supernatural outside of Jesus Christ, you are playing with this spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a board game. I don't care if, if, if it's that uh, Ouija board and you think it's all innocent. Mm -hmm. Anytime you are tapping into a spiritual realm outside of Jesus Christ, you are playing with this spirit. Remember, snakes grow in their own atmosphere, right? right? Python grows in its own atmosphere. A rattlesnake grows in its own atmosphere in the, the desert. You are creating an atmosphere for that snake to grow. You are creating an atmosphere. And the more you play with it and the more you create, the more presence it will have. Wow. Dead people do not talk to you. That was absolutely profound. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> when Jesus gave the parable about, about Lazarus uh, and, and, and the beggar and the rich man, and the rich man went to hell and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, the rich man said, can, I, can you send him over with some water? And Abraham said, no, we can't send him over. He cannot leave where he's at, and you cannot leave where he's at. And then the rich man, he, 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 he pleaded a, a second request. He said, can you at least send him to my brothers, to my relatives, so they don't end up where I'm at? And again, Abraham said, no, he, he can't leave. You don't understand. He cannot leave. He is dead. Dead people do not come back. Not through mediums, not through sorcery, not through witchcraft, not through white witchcraft, black witchcraft, not through any dead people do not come back. There is only one time in the Bible that a dead person came back, only once, and that is found in 1 Samuel chapter 28. I'm going to take a minute and read this to you because it is absolutely profound. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse, we're going to start at verse 3. You see, Saul is about ready to go in the battle. Samuel, the prophet, over that nation has died. And Samuel was the one who always gives Saul advice. Saul is about ready to go in the battle, and he's panicking. He's, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, I don't even have Samuel to give me advice. Now, Saul had made a decree that all the mediums be put to death throughout the country. But, but now he's desperate. He's so desperate he doesn't know what to do. He's afraid he's going to go into battle and die. And he's looking for that one word from God that says, you, you'll be successful. So he, he asked his men, he said, can we find a medium? Is there anybody left in the land that's hiding? I know I said I want them all dead, but surely there's got to be one that's hiding. And the men said, yeah, there is this one lady uh, that we know of, and we can take you there. There is one, starting, we're going to jump to verse uh, 7. There is one 
in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself and putting on other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, who shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. But the king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said, I see spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down, and he prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And Samuel said to him, he said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Now, I read that portion of Scripture for one reason and only one reason. When the media saw Samuel, what did she do? She screamed out in amazement. Why? Because she had never seen a real person come from the grave. In all of the seances and calling up of the dead and, and all of that, what she was seeing was familiar spirits masking themselves to be that person that had died. They were familiar spirit. She was used to seeing familiar spirit. She had never seen the real McCoy. And when she saw Samuel, she freaked out. <laughs> Dead people do not communicate with you. Do not try to communicate with them. We are created as spiritual beings for one reason and one reason only, and that is to be connected to a spiritual God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And that is our spiritual connection yes. to nothing else other than Himself. Amen. Be careful, parents, with what your children dabble with. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what my horoscope is. I could be a... I don't even know what they are. And I really, truly don't care to know. I have asked before my sign, it is him. I am a born-again Christian filled with the Holy Ghost. And no article in the newspaper is going to determine my future and what I do. I don't care. I have been led by the Holy Spirit. I have been given discernment to discern my way. And the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And I believe that with everything within me, I attempt to live righteously. So I have to believe that he is ordering my steps. And I'm not getting it from a newspaper while I drink a cup of coffee. Amen. Come on. Come on. Because if that is being driven by a familiar spirit, God is asking me to go left. And I can guarantee you it's going to tell me to go right. Mm -hmm. And some of you, you're messed up today. And you're going down the wrong path and the wrong road because you are listening to the wrong things. You are listening to something that is driven by a familiar spirit. And we need to denounce it. We need to rebuke it. We need to put it in its place. The second spirit I want to look at is a lying spirit. A lying spirit. We're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 20 through 22. I, I've done a lot of study on this portion of Scripture. This thing just arrested me uh, for the last couple of weeks. And there is a lot of commentary on this. And, 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 and I'm, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to take it at face value. I, I am. I've looked at it every which way. Uh, I still have some questions, but I, I'm going to take it at, at face value. Listen, listen to this portion of Scripture. <clears throat> it 
You see, Ahab, king of Israel, is ready to go to war. And he has allied himself with Jehoshaphat, uh, the king of Judah. And they called for all the prophets to prophesy. And all the prophets have prophesied good things. But uh, Jehoshaphat smells something funny. And he said, isn't there one more prophet in the land? And Ahab said, well, there's this guy, Micah, but I don't like him. He never prophesies really what I want to hear. But Jehoshaphat says, go get him anyway. I, I'd like to hear what he says. And uh, so in verse 19, they get Micah. And Micah prophesies what they want to hear. And uh, many commentators said that he did it sarcastically, making fun of the other prophets. And, and finally, uh, Ahab says, no, didn't I ask you to tell me what God was really speaking to you? And he does in verse 19. He says, and Micah continued, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramah Gilead and going to his death there? And one suggested this and another that finally a spirit came forth and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. The Spirit said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. Go and do it. You will succeed in enticing him. Go and do it. This portion of Scripture it's probably the clearest example of a lying spirit. I'm going to give you three cases. And I want to look at each case just a little bit analytically. This would be case number one. You see, Ahab and his wife Jezebel have been worshiping Baal and leading a nation into a worship of Baal. And God has raised up his prophet Elijah. And uh, Elijah has prophesied against the nation, and he's prophesied against Ahab, and he's prophesied against uh, Jezebel. Right. Right. And Elijah has even gone as far as to call a famine on the land. And they've gone now years, three years, without rain. And finally, the, the, the big day comes where the nation cannot withstand the famine any longer. And Elijah comes to the place where he says, well, let's have a showdown. Let's bring out the 400, 450 prophets of Baal. And let's see which God answers by fire. And let that God be the true God. And they do so. And God calls fire down from heaven. And God uh, licks up the sacrifice, licks up the water. He licks up the dust of the earth. And, and he consumes everything. And, and Elijah said, now kill all the prophets of Baal. And they do. So my point is that Ahab has stopped worshiping Baal. He no longer worships Baal, but he has not repented, and he is not worshiping God. There is a difference. We can stop doing something very bad, but just because we stop does not mean that we have repented and that we are serving God. So Ahab, in his lifestyle, and because he has not repented, and he is not serving God, he has created now an atmosphere for a lying spirit to operate and to grow and to lie, actually then causing him his death in battle. That's case number one. Case number two, in Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. This is the early church. They have miracles happening. People are being raised from the dead. People are being healed. The, the, the apostles are walking the street, and even their shadows are healing people. I mean, holy smokes. But in chapter 5, and verse 1, it says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. 
but he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart so that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Now that's the key to this passage. That's the key to this text. Why is it that Satan has filled your heart so that you have lied? Why, why is it that he filled your heart so that you have lied? Verse 3, then Peter said in his how has that, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Well, the story goes on that God intercedes. And Ananias drops dead right there. Boom. Right. His wife comes in sometime later, and Peter asks her the question, did you sell the land for this or for that? And she says yes, and she drops dead like her husband. Now, I always ask myself, why such a severe punishment for these people? Now, now listen carefully. There was no reason for them to lie. The land was theirs. They could have sold it for any amount of money they wanted to. There was no reason for them to lie. Even Peter said, Peter said in verse 4, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing something like that? It was because Satan had put it in their heart to perpetrate a lie in God's family in the house of God. Wow. There's so much that could be said about this. How does the enemy destroy the family of God? We saw it right here. By putting lies into his family, God's family, by putting a lie, by perpetuating a lie within the family. That's why God dealt with it so severely. That's why he cut it off immediately. The Holy Spirit is moving in that early church, and that was a foothold of the devil and to get a foothold into that church, that early church of Acts, was to do so by inspiring this couple to lie over nothing. They didn't benefit by the lie. Wow. So why would they lie? Well, I can only guess it was probably because of ego. So that tells me that if I want people to think I'm a something that I'm a not, right, right. well, I want you to believe I put more money in the offering than I actually did. And if my ego is driving me, what is one of the things that God cannot stand in is ego pride, right? So if my ego is driving me in that family of God, in the house of God, that tells me that that is an atmosphere to read a lie. Kind of like the guy that went fishing and he caught the three-inch fish, but by the time he tells the story, it's seven feet, right? His ego will not allow him to admit it was only three inches, he's got to make it a little bit bigger every time he tells it because everybody goes, wow. <laughs> Don't kid yourself, that happens in church. Well. That happens in church. Can I tell you that happens in ministry? Yes. Case number three. And then we're going to wrap this one up. In Matthew chapter 16, 22 through 23, I'm not going to take time to read it because you all know it. Peter and Jesus, the disciples, are walking along and Peter's talking about his death on the cross. Uh, Jesus is talking about his death on the cross and Peter says to Jesus, Peter interrupts him and Peter says, no, 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 no. You're not going to the cross. You're not going to die. And Jesus turns around and he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. 
He didn't talk to Peter. He talked to the lying spirit. Remember I said we don't know who we fight and we always do the battle here. See, we talk to each other. We don't talk to the, to the lying spirit. Jesus didn't talk to Peter. He talked directly to the spirit. Now, I'm sure that Peter meant well. I'm sure all of that. But somehow, there was something in Peter's life that this lying spirit could place a lie within him to the extent that he believed it, and then he began to speak it. Okay. So we have three cases dealing with the lying spirit. There's a lot more, but I only pulled these three because they show three different examples. But let me give you now, let me wrap it up and do a case study and give you the facts. Number one, a lying spirit will lie about you through other people. A lying spirit will often attempt to destroy your reputation by lying about you through other people and making sure you hear it. Lie about me all you want, as long as I don't know it, it ain't going to affect me. But he will make sure that I hear it through the grapevine. A lying spirit will lie to you through other people. A lying spirit will lie directly to you all by itself. That's why people like uh, commit suicide. I was watching a show last night, and I forget the stats. It was, it, it was amazing. It was something like 12 out of 20 people contemplate suicide. It's because they're listening to a lie that's being spoken deeply inside of them, that you are worth nothing. Nobody cares. You will never become anything. People today are wasting their lives because a lying spirit has lied to them directly. And they believe it. Number four, seemingly spiritual people can be affected by a lying spirit, especially those in leadership who are not mature. Oh. <laughs> Hence the prophets of Ahab. You see, if you, if you research their origin, they were not prophets that worshipped God in his temple, but they were prophets that had actually worshipped the golden calf Back in the earlier days of the children of Israel, that was their lineage. And it's many believe that they were not true prophets of God, but they were house prophets of Ahab that he had surrounded himself so that he could solicit what he wanted to hear and believe it was God. Paul said, lay hands on no man suddenly. There has to be the test of time and maturity and, and, and before you go lay hands on people, I have watched young leaders destroy people. When you follow a leader, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. make sure that that leader, whoever they are, they are connected and in tune with God. Yes. Because if you're following a leader that is sometimes on and sometimes off, and you catch him when he's sometimes off, he might be listening to a lying spirit and he might be speaking from that spiritual point of view, which is a lie. A lying spirit will lie to anybody that it can. It doesn't care whether you carry a Bible or not. Families are ruined by lying spirits. Families are divided by lying spirits. My family was. My, my relatives, my grandparents, they hated it. They hated it. They hated half the family forever. They hated me because I didn't marry a Portuguese gal. I was cut off from the family for a long time. And, oh, it was horrible. My family was, they were weird. But they listened to a whole pile of lies that they believed. Lying spirits will split churches. Every church division, and I've seen a lot of them, and every, thank God, I have never been involved in a church split or division like that. But every one that I have been a part of the counseling and the restoration, every single last one of them was caused by a lying spirit. Attempting to get folks to believe a lie. 
It's the old saying in business. What if you climb the ladder of success your whole life only to get to the top and find the ladders against the wrong building? <laughs> Oops. People will believe a lie only many times to find out too late that that's what it was a lie. I'm going to give you one last point. Oppressed or possessed, and we're going to stop with this. Can you be oppressed or possessed? I did not want to end without talking about that. Because in many Pentecostal circles, we make a distinction between being possessed and oppressed. And that distinction is this. If you are saved, you cannot be possessed. You can be oppressed. How many of you have heard that? If you do not know the Lord, if you do not know the Lord, you can be possessed. Dr. John got my mind going last week on something. In the Greek, in the Greek, when it talks about possession and oppression, they are one and the same. If there is only one word used, and I'm going to try to say it right. Demo is obey. But there is only one word used, and it is used to mean demonized. One word, demonized. There is no distinction between oppressed or possessed. So, pastor, can a Christian be bothered by the devil? Yeah. Can, can, can a Christian be really bothered by the devil? Yeah. And this is the way I break it down. The devil will take as much square footage as you give him. He'll take as much square footage as you give him. The devil will take as much atmosphere as you create. It doesn't matter if you are born again or not. He will take as much as you give him. Now, through Jesus Christ, we have authority over him. We have power over him. We have the ability and the power to give him no atmosphere and no square footage at all and allow the Holy Spirit to rule and to reign in every fiber of our being. You have the power to do that. I have the power. But if I choose, because I am a free moral agent. I am, God has given me the ability to choose and to make choices. If I choose not to, I can be saved. I can be going to heaven, but I can be demonized all the same. So, okay, let me illustrate. If I, as a Christian, I am free from lying. But if I choose to lie, Let's just say I choose to tell some lies here and there. I, I choose to lie. I am creating an atmosphere now for a lying spirit. He didn't just come upon me to possess me. I, I, I just didn't walk down the street and all of a sudden, whoa, whoa, there's a devil here. He didn't do that. But I gave him permission. I said, watch this. I'm going to tell Pastor L.T. a lie. I I'm going to tell Pastor Maria. I'm going to tell her a lie. Oh, I'm going to go over to this person, and I'm going to tell them the great thing that I did that I actually really didn't do. Oh, I I'm going to lie about this. I I'm going to lie about what I have. I and you know what? The more I do it, the more I like doing it. Because it all makes me look really good. But I'm creating an atmosphere in my life for a lying spirit to become involved in. And that lying spirit will begin to tell me more lies. That lying spirit will begin to use other people to lie to me. And the more I invite it, the more lies are coming into my life and the less truth there is. Till pretty soon, my life is engulfed in lies and you can't see where the truth starts and stops. Everything is a lie, but I'm still going to heaven. I'm just a liar. Do you see that? There is only one word in the Greek. As much space as you give him, 
he is certainly willing to take. Your and my job is to give him no space. Amen. I don't have to give him not one inch in my life. And I have the power when he's around to kick his butt Amen. and to kick him out. I don't have to give him anything. You don't have to give him anything. And if you have in the past, you have the power in Jesus' name to cancel his assignment right now. No, I used to do this, and I used to do that. I gave you an atmosphere, and I gave you permission. But guess what? I'm taking it back. I'm canceling your assignment right now. You're done. So go bother somebody else. Jesus gave a parable. He said that when the demon left, and the house was clean and swept clean, uh, the demon went out and roamed around in arid places, and the demon came back to see if the house was empty. And the house was empty, and he brought seven more demons more wicked than himself. So that tells me there are levels of wickedness. There are levels of wickedness, but he brought seven others because the house was quite clean, which tells me that there was no presence of God in that house. Wow. Let me leave you with this. Let's all stand together. The more light you have, the less darkness there will be. Because light always cancels out darkness. Spend time worshiping God. Spend time in God's Word. Spend time praying. Spend time fellowshipping with the Lord, and you build light. And the devil hates light because he breathes in an atmosphere of darkness. The more light, the less darkness, the less his presence. Everything that the devil then will do, he will do to other people to affect you, but he can never directly affect you because there's too much light. What did demons do when they saw Jesus? They screamed, and they fled, or they got cast out. That should happen to you and I when we walk down the street. Demon can't get within 10, 20 feet of us. There's so much light, they cannot get anywhere near to the light. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that as we go, some of us here today, we have invited the presence of the enemy. We have we've invited uh, demon spirits to interact within our life. And Lord, sometimes some of us, we maybe have done it knowingly. Uh, some maybe we have done it not knowing at all. That's uh, just happened. Some of us, we've been listening to lies for a long time. Some of us, you know, we've been dealing with the familiar spirit for a long time. And Lord, right now, whatever it is, whatever, whatever demonic spirit that is infecting us, that is bugging us, that is interfering with our life, right now, in the name of Jesus, we cancel assignment. We cancel it right now 